All right, guys, so I haven't done one of these in a little bit of time, but we're doing a Q&A. I have a ton of questions that people have asked me through my Instagram account, but also in some of the comments of my videos, I went through them all. I'm gonna try to get every question answered, but I can't promise that I will. All right, so let's get started. We'll get some housekeeping out of the way, and then we'll get right into the questions. Let's go. All right, so if you guys watched my last short video, you'd know that this channel is this close to becoming YouTube Partner Certified. So what that means is basically when you have a YouTube channel, you can become part of the YouTube Partnership Program where you would essentially have different features associated to your account. Well, to get that, you've got to have no copyright uh, claims on your account, which I don't have any. You also have to have two-factor verification set up, which I do. And then here are the two big things. You've got to have 1,000 subscribers, which I do. We just hit over 1,000 subscribers. I'm so grateful to everyone. And then the second thing is you have to have 4,000 watched hours. Basically, that's an hour worth of watching for, I don't know, each person or something like that, or maybe multiple. Anyway, 4,000 watch hours. We are at 3,000. 581 hours watched, so we're not far off, and that number keeps growing day by day by day. That's first thing with housekeeping. The second thing is I gotta share with you guys. I have a friend whom I've never met in person, but she has sent so many gifts to the kids that I've had in this home over the year, and her name is Kristen. She is an amazing person, an amazing soul. She comments on the Facebook posts all the time. She's always commenting on the YouTube uh videos. I shout her out all the time. She is going through an adoption journey of her own. So I told her in this video, I'm going to do her a favor. I'm going to shout you out and talk about her GoFundMe. So please, please, if y'all do anything, don't even worry about liking this video, but like this video. <laughs> please, if you could do anything, like this video, but also in the description below, I'm going to put the link for Kristen's GoFundMe campaign. Just donate a couple bucks. Guys, you don't understand with GoFundMe campaigns. If you donate $1, it's $1 more someone has. $5, $20, $100, whatever you can donate. No little, no amount is too little and surely no amount is too large. What that does is it tells GoFundMe and all these different social media platforms that that campaign has action around it. And just like YouTube, watching YouTube videos, it spikes the views and the uh, recommendations of YouTube. The same thing happens with GoFundMe campaigns in turn, which will happen with Kristen's GoFundMe campaign. So all of y'all clearly support foster care, foster to adopt, adoption and all that stuff. Pay it forward. Donate at least a dollar to Kristen's campaign. It's in the description below. All right, so let's get started. We're gonna start with these questions. First question is this. Okay, I'm gonna start off with this question because I think it applies to me so well and it's also something that I hear a lot of people in the LGBTQ community um, struggle with, whether this is true or not. But keep in mind, all of these questions that are asked of me, I am going to be answering them in respect to loss Angeles County because that is where I am licensed and depending on the county you're licensed in in the entire United States there could be different rules or whatever so this question of being worried about uh, foster families biological families discriminating against someone because they are LGBTQ um, is a very very important topic so first off I think it's really important that you understand that Anyone, as I'm sure you know, can discriminate against you. They're, they can discriminate against us because of our sexual orientation, because of our race, because of our gender. You never know. Um, and it's a sad, sad thing. And as far as any tips, honestly, honestly, it's something I feared myself. And as you're fostering kids and you're doing um, visitations with them and their their biological family you're going to end up knowing these people especially if you have infants like myself any visits i've ever done like it's me and the parents talking because the, the infants can't talk you know they hold them they change their diapers and they feed them and things but you end up talking and you get to really know these people and they get to really know you 
And the topic of sexuality isn't, it doesn't have to come up, but as you get to know someone, things like that come up. So what I've done in the past is I've just, if it was ever brought up, I said, yeah, I'm gay. And it's just that simple. Um, as I've gotten to know some of the parents more, I have shared with them, as they've shared some personal things with me, I've shared with them, that it was a little bit scary, that, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes, especially of gay men, that were predators and things like that, which are absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I was worried that, like, what are certain parents gonna think? Are they gonna be worried at all? And honestly, <laughs> I've only gotten amazing things. Like one, one family said to me, I'm happy that you're gay because I know gay people love kids so much and that a lot of them want kids. So I know my child's gonna be well taken care of. But just remember, anyone can be discriminated against and it's something, unfortunately, minorities of all sorts just have to deal with sometimes. And this is what I would say, be the bigger person and take it with grace and put a smile on your face, okay? Because nobody can fight against that. And then also remember, at least in LA County, that's not supposed to be talked about. You're not supposed to talk about these things. And one time it did come up and it was uncomfortable for me. And I explained it to the social worker and she right away communicated with that, with that family. You are not to talk about this at all. You are there to be there with your child, not have conversation, not be talking about personal life stuff. So you can always default to that. So hopefully that helps. Just remember with biological family, they're there to see their children. You're not there to talk about the case. You are there to strictly be a monitor for them and their children. Okay, so this next one has to do with me a little bit as well. So um, let's see, you're asking about placements with infants and being told that you would get infant placements right away. How long have I been, um, was I, foster care license before I got an infant placement. As you guys can see on my channel, I do tend to get a fair amount of babies placed in my home. Baby A is the sixth baby that I've had placed with me. So um, I love that you're from Maryland. I actually was raised in Maryland, so shout out there. Um, here's the thing, again, I can't speak for other counties, I can just speak for Los Angeles County. What I can tell you is there are Facebook groups here in Los Angeles where there are people that know of placements and they are posting in the foster groups. Um, does anyone have availability for a home for this child? Baby placements are so difficult to get. It is no joke. First off, a lot of babies go to biological family right off the bat. And if they do not, they go into a foster home and a lot of them end up back with family because you're typically an emergency placement. So just remember that. Just because you get placed with a baby does not mean you're adopting that baby. The first one, fourth one, fifth one, doesn't mean you're adopting that, that, that child. Um, also, from my experience, you're gonna hear a lot. You're gonna hear a lot from foster, uh, other foster families. You're gonna hear a lot from social workers. You're gonna hear a lot from different people in this industry. And you have to learn to filter things. You have to learn to just yeah, they may have told me this and that's not happening and it is extremely frustrating. Trust me, I understand. I get so frustrated sometimes. You have to find an advocate that you can talk to and vent to to get anything out. Maybe I'll start an anonymous email address and people could just write their freaking vents in there and send me and I don't know, just have a place to vent. I don't really even know. But you have to find that. You gotta find someone to talk to and vent everything out to you because if you're doing this alone or you're doing this with people who haven't done this before get on social media and build your community if you're not a youtuber or whatever just because you're not doing like what i'm doing and advocating and if you looked at my instagram i take very curated photos and i put my my story into the caption if you're not that person doesn't mean you can't get on Instagram and talk to people like me, talk to other people that are doing this because it is very frustrating when you're told one thing and it's not happening. So I got licensed on December 1st. I didn't get my first placement until February, February 4th, 2021. You just gotta know that things shift and they change all the time. If you wanna do this, you have to just stick it out. That's the best piece of advice I can give you. You have to stick this out is a crazy long, wild journey and if you don't if you realize you started and you don't want to do it anymore just stop <laughs> you don't have to keep doing this but 
it can take a long time, I would find groups online in Maryland that are around foster care and talk to the people in those Facebook groups because I, I guarantee you they're there and you're gonna get a lot of help there. Okay, this is a lot of questions in one, so I'm gonna try and breeze through them all. So what are visits like with my agency? Well, first off, I don't do visitations at my agency. Um, most people don't do them at agencies. What I will say is my agency does come to my home or we do it virtually once a week. For the first three or three, no, first six months of a placement, we do them once a week. After that, we do every other week for that placement. Uh, when I have two, two children, like I just have another baby now, she's now coming every week. Um, or sometimes we'll do virtual. It, does, it just depends on what's going on. Um, so those I do do. However, visits with biological family, we just meet at a park or like at a Starbucks or something. That's all prearranged between myself and the social workers and the other and the family. So doing visits at, at the agency, it can happen, but I don't do that. It's just easier to meet around the house. Also, you can have a social worker do the visit and monitor the visit for you and it does happen. It's typically not the social worker, it's usually, at least in LA County, it's a worker that is paid specifically to monitor visits, transport and monitor the visitation. Um, I've never done it, I've thought about using that before, but sometimes you get like, ah, that's good, that's not good, it could piss off a social worker, it could not piss off, you don't know. So I've kind of stayed away from it and because I'm a real estate agent and my work is flexible, I'm able to make all the visits anyway. So. That's never been an issue for me. And those of you that are um, working nine to five, if you're gonna drop the child off at daycare, you can have a worker pick that child up at daycare, take them to the visit, bring them back to daycare, and you're just doing the morning and evening drop off for daycare. Um, and then the other thing I'll say, like I kind of answered that in the other question, biological families, fine. I mean, it just depends on the family, it depends on the case. I've heard horror stories. I've heard of biological family, um, uh, kidnapping the kids at a visit. Literally, they had to call 911 to go find the kid, kids and the parents. Like, I literally have heard that. I've, I've heard of biological families like following a foster family home. Like, these are the things I've heard. But I've also have experience like myself where we're actually really kosher with each other and really friendly and there's no, no real big issues. Of course, you know, we, it's a real awkward situation but you gotta be an adult. You gotta be the adult and the bigger person because you know, we're not in their situations. We don't know what it's like to be, to have a child taken from us in this respect. So you gotta just like be humble and take the personality out and just act off principles only. This is a very good question. It does happen. And you need to know this when you are a foster parent. So in LA County, you hold specific and very limited medical and educational rights. So. Yes, the child is a ward of the state. They are detained by the state and in the custody of the state. However, in LA County, the mother and the father continue to hold medical and educational rights to the child until one or either, if ever, their rights, paternal rights are revoked, then they no longer have those rights to the child. So as a foster parent, you can take them into, if they're sick to the doctor, you can make decisions on, okay, they need this medication, this medication. You could take to get the kids vaccinated and often have to. Um, you can make all those decisions. So if I wanted to take one of the kids to get um, a COVID shot, I could do that unless the kid refused, you're not allowed to make them get a COVID shot. You cannot make any surgical decisions. Uh, so when baby, baby A was in the NICU the entire time, I could not make major decisions for her care. I was allowed to be there and was the only person that was allowed to be there 24 seven, come and go as I wish. Um, but I could not make major decisions. Like if she had needed surgery, they would have had to have mom make that decision. And I'm fairly certain because we did do a surgery with one of the children that I have, I'm fairly certain the parents can't even make that decision. It still needs to be ordered by a judge. And that's a simple process from what I understand that the social worker basically just has to send in a walk-on request, meaning they're sending a request to the judge right away and the judge either signs off or doesn't sign off on that surgery. Um, but you, it's limited. Some medical rights you do, some of them you just don't because they're not your, your legal uh, child. This question, 
one I, I I can't really say because it'll it'll um, allege too much about a case. I will just say this: I would love to adopt the children currently in, in my care. Um, I'm not going to say if I think I will be able to. I'm not going to say if I think I won't be able to because it's just too personal. So if I ever get to and we get to that point, trust me, y'all will know. Okay. And if I don't get to with these children, then I will keep going and hopefully adopt a child in the near future. So that's where I'm leaving that one. Okay, cool. This is a good question. So my typical week, honestly, it revolves around these children. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I do visitations with the children. On Friday, there is one who I'm currently dropping off to a, to a parent. Uh, and then on Sunday, I'm picking that, that child up. Um, I, I really have a lot of flexibility with my schedule <clears throat> and I'm very passionate about foster care. So it is very much focused around them. But outside of visitations, I'm trying to work as much as I can. I either work from my computer from home, I'll work at Starbucks down the street, or I'll go show a property. I have an open house on Sunday that I'm doing in Hollywood, it's the border of Hollywood and West Hollywood. So if you wanna buy a house, <laughs> check that one out. Um, but you know, like it's, it's your typical work week. I do fully, fully, fully understand that people that are self-employed have a little bit more of an advantage with our flexibility as opposed to those who work a nine to five or an eight to four, whatever it may be, and you have that more steady, specific schedule throughout the week. Um, I do know I hear stories where people that have those schedules are doing visits in the evening or typically on the weekends. Um, as far as court, you're going to court every, what, six months sometimes. You're going, depending on the case, like I have three court hearings in June, one in the beginning, one in the middle, one in the end between the two children. I don't have to attend any of them. I typically go to all of them. So those days I will be out of commission and I will be at the courthouse for as long as I need to be there for that. The difference between foster care and foster to adopt um, and can you adopt only once TPR happens? Well, I'll go backwards with that. Yes, the only way you could adopt a child is if TPR or termination of parental rights uh, happens. You, you can't just take someone's child and say, I'm gonna adopt them. Um, that is a process that happens well into a case. I mean, like, they're not gonna terminate rights until they have like literally done everything they could to re reunify this child to the biological parent or parents or they try to find family member anywhere biologically that can adopt or take legal guardianship of the child. Once all of that has happened, they're going to move that child to adoption. And typically as the long-term foster care provider, you're gonna be asked to adopt that child. So yeah, anytime you're doing this, you're doing the foster care process, the true sense of foster care and the idea and the intent is to reunify that child with the biological family of some sort. However, if that does not happen, then it turns into an adoption case case and you would be you would then become asked to adopt with infants they typically will ask you from the very beginning once they place that kid in your house are you willing to provide permanency for this child and essentially they're just asking you are you willing and able to adopt that child because they want to know that if that child doesn't reunify, that they're gonna stay consistent in the home that they're with. Three things I've learned about myself. One, patience. Uh, I am a very, typically a very spontaneous, impulsive person. And this process has definitely taught me about being more patient and understanding that things take time and that not everything can happen as quickly as Kevin wants it to happen. So that's been anything from getting placements to dealing with children and raising children and having to have expectations that are realistic for them, but also set my own personal expectations and needs and desires to a level that makes sense for me. Like for example, cleaning the house sometimes, like most of the time this place is a mess and I do not typically live that way. But when you have two kids and you're single, like. You have to pick your battles, so definitely patience. The other thing I think I have learned, probably how to give, but not give too much of yourself. 
I want to do everything and anything to like control situations, but also anything and everything to like be nice. Uh, probably way too much, like a people pleaser almost. So I've had to learn like, I, I think we, also with fear, I think fear, control and people pleasing all kind of goes together because I want to control because I'm scared of the outcome. And I want to please everyone because I'm just scared of the outcome. So it all kind of goes together. I've had to learn like, first you can't control, you, you literally can't control this at all. And second, I've had to understand that just because someone who's lost their children wants something from you doesn't mean you're required to give them it. Just because a social worker doesn't want to do something or would rather you do something doesn't mean you have to say yes and that doesn't mean you have to fear that you're going to lose the child in your care because you have the right to say no. It's very easily said and all of this is very difficult to actually implement in life. And I think the third thing would be, oh, the third thing is definitely right-sizing things and finding out what really matters and priorities. So sometimes you guys will see, I have a video every single week. Sometimes I'll go 14 days without a video. It is what it is. Like these children have taught me what really matters. And while I love vlogging and I love social media and all of that jazz, it's not number one in my life. The children are number one in my life. Raising them is number one in my life. So when I naturally am like, oh my God, I haven't put a video out. It's gonna mess with the algorithm. People are gonna get mad at me. Ah! The shorts obviously are really nice because I've utilized those sometimes to like communicate with you guys off the bat and say, hey, look, a video is coming or whatever it may be. But also there's times where I'm like, yo, I've been in the NICU for a month videos are going to have to take the back burner or i've got a bunch of um visits to do videos are just gonna have to take a back burner so definitely like realizing what really matters going out on friday and saturday night i don't get to do that i used to see three movies a week when i had amc a list you could see a ton of movies i used to go to movies all the time by myself i can't do that anymore you know i've seen one movie in the last i think seven months one or two movies so uh, definitely right-sizing what's what's really, really important in life. Okay, so we're almost finished here. Last two questions. So how am I splitting my time between baby R and baby A? <laughs> Please, y'all gonna have to answer that question. It is so difficult. Look, the best thing I can say when there's two babies and you're single is get the ages enough far apart. So when I had baby R and baby T, they were literally two weeks apart. So both six months old, it was absolute madness because they're doing all the same things. They're wanting attention the same way. When it's nighttime in those witching hours, they are both screaming, it's crazy. Whereas now with baby R, who's 10 months old, he's crawling everywhere, climbing up on things, wants to stand. The boy literally climbs on me and climbs up my body sure that's a lot and it gets to be exhausting sometimes he sees me eating he automatically wants to eat i can't even drink coffee without like trying to put little snacks in his mouth so he feels like he's eating it's really crazy and then i have baby a here who is just over a month old but she's been here in there the entire time sleeping all the infants do these one two month olds all they do is sleep they don't really start being super, super, super needy until three, four months old. But before then, they just sleep and they literally wake up. This girl right here will wake up to tell me she's hungry and she'll eat and she'll go back to sleep. She'll wake up to tell me her diaper's dirty and she'll get it clean and she'll go back to sleep. I, for some reason with her, there's something about us that's connected. I'm like, literally can be getting her bottle ready and she'll wake up and it's not that she hears it it's just like my timing with her is so on point um i also use the huckleberry app to like list everything i don't personally need the app because like i said we are very in sync for some reason but it is nice because with everything on there you can like export it out and i think it'll be very helpful for a doctor to see all of her eating or sleeping her diapers and all of that jazz because they do ask those questions a lot but honestly like it's challenging guys like it's definitely challenging but you know i have a lot of friends and they help babysit when needed 
but you do, you definitely do give up a lot of your time. But I know my end goal and I know what I'm providing to these kids in the meantime. And if they ever stay with me, I know that what I've provided to them is something that they will have long, they're gonna have throughout their life. But if they're, they're if they ever get adopted by me, I know that I've, I didn't shortchange them or whomever they're with. So it's hard, but I do it. And the last question, do I like foster care? Whew. If I didn't like foster care, I wouldn't be doing this. I, I, I don't know if I'll do it after I adopt. We'll have to see how I feel post-adoption. Right now, I don't know if I'll do it. I do know that I love providing love and nurturing to children. Um, it's a very taxing, taxing, taxing role to play in this world. Um, reunifying children is very difficult. Um, you put a lot of time and energy into it. And as much as anyone wants to say, it's for the children and, you know, and all the roses and it's great. It is great if they go home. It is. It's wonderful if a mother or father and or both are like doing everything they're supposed to do to get their children back and they change their life. That's fantastic. And if that child knows them through the process, that's amazing. Like truly, truly, truly amazing. I just saw a picture from one of the children I reunified back way back when the kid is gorgeous and beautiful and he looks so happy she got all her children back wonderful but like it also hurts the foster parent it's hard like i don't like when people take away our pain we sacrifice so much for these children just like biological parents sacrifice why shouldn't we be hurt and affected by this we're human beings, and if we provided true love and care and bonding, and we're not affected, well then I really honestly question if you actually provided what an infant needs. They bring them into our home because we at that time are fit to love, care, and support a child. And that is an emotional connection that would hurt to break. So do I like foster care? Absolutely, I like it, I wouldn't do this. Uh, do I wanna continue doing it after the fact? I don't know right now. I do know this. After I affect, after I adopt, I will absolutely be going into more like advocacy work for foster children and things of that nature, but that'll be down the road. So do I like it? Yeah, I like it, but there's definitely very hard times to it. And um, yeah, so that's it. That's all the questions. Thank you guys for watching and supporting. Look, just y'all, y'all, just thank you so much. Literally, you guys have been there so much for me in the past and I wanted to stop this and y'all inspired me to keep going and I'm so happy that I have. And um, hit the like button, <laughs> hit the bell icon. That's the last thing I'll say in promotion, hit the bell icon because I go live sometimes and then people are like, ha, ah, I missed it, I can't believe it. You probably didn't have the bell icon on so you didn't know that I was live at the moment. Other than that, I love you all. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It really means the world to me. You guys literally, literally keep me going in this journey. So I love you. Peace out. Bye.